so hi everyone uh, very good morning uh, thank you for joining so my name is mohini singh i am the co founder from cx2 junction and uh, i am amazed to see uh, you guys uh, you know uh, out of your busy schedule uh, you have taken time to join this session today and i welcome you all to this virtual session on goal based investment planning for cxos uh, with happiness factory uh, so uh, talking about you know just a glimpse of cx2 junction what we do we are a community a niche community for the enterprise leaders to discuss to come together discuss the evolving scene of cyber security risk management and emerging technologies so uh, we we conduct a lot of sessions lot of webinars lot of physical meetings where we discuss about the technologies about the services and what is there for the uh, you know industry leaders uh, to uh, you know work uh, to, to know about so today uh, we have uh, happiness factory uh, who is going to take this session on what is the importance of goal based invest investment planning uh, for uh, you know cxos like you and uh, happiness factory they actually help people to make their life uh, lives happy rich through goal based investment and help wealth management business thrive so they challenge the common notion that the key to happiness is to make more money as they strongly believe that money is just a way to achieve your goals and shape a happy rich life so by adding a unique twist to the familiar concept of investment planning they seek to understand uh, what makes you happy and um, so to deliver on this topic to uh, give us you know insights on this topic we have ranjini prabhu tendulkar who is the vp and financial coach at the happiness factory so uh, before i hand over this platform to her i just have uh, two announcement for you all that uh, you know it will be great to have your uh, valuable feedback after this session you know it is very valuable to understand what kind of content you are looking at and it was that session actually useful for you and uh, if we can further discuss on this after this uh, session so just a second yes so i will request uh, you know around uh, some time after this session uh, we all will be rolling out a feedback form in the zoom chat i would like everybody to spend one minute of your time and uh, fill up that feedback form and uh, yes and moreover we are going to have a wheel of fortune based on the you know whatever responses i get from the feedbacks and would love to give one lucky winner a cxo junction goodie so yes that's it from my side uh, ranjini uh, the platform is all yours yeah Thanks so much, Moini. Thanks a ton. So before I start this session, I think a big thank you to Gaurav, Moini, and the entire team for uh, giving me this opportunity to address this, um, you know, esteemed group of uh, professionals. Uh, welcome, a very, very warm welcome to this particular session. Uh, it, it is, I'm sure, a very, very important aspect in every working professional's life. Uh, truly something to look forward to. And we call it the golden innings, right? And I'm referring to what you all would probably, you know, uh, a layman's language, it is retirement, but clearly it's a new beginning. And this can absolutely be wonderful. If you have two really essential components to make this wonderful, one has much to live on and much to live for. So I'm sure the latter part of it is something that each one of us has clearly created a bucket list of things that we would like to do, you know, post hanging up our boots, right? It could be anything right from uh, probably just chilling away to glory, spending more time with the family, or to probably start an entrepreneur uh, venture, or just about probably trying, uh, you know, your hand at something very new in terms of probably a new canvas that you want to look at painting, or maybe explore, um, I mean, do globe trotting, whatever it could be, right? There could be so many of those things that each one of us really wishes to do. And because of time constraint, uh, that's one thing that's always you know, uh, on the back of our uh, list of priorities. So this is surely a second innings for you to look, look forward to and do all of these things that you want to do. Having said that, I think one thing that's very, very important that you can make this truly uh, a happening second innings is to, you know, have that feeling of assurance that you have enough to be able to start this second innings in a wonderful manner. And this is where as, um, you know, financial coach, I'm going to be trying to bring in some insights through my experience, through my, um, you know, discussions with CXOs that I've been having for over a decade now. Uh, and I hope 
there are a lot of valuable insights to take away. Let me tell you, these are all very, very simple things that I'm sure all of us clearly know. It's only the gap between knowing and doing. And that's clearly what I have seen, which clearly translates into whether you have a wonderful second innings to start or not. So it's very, very simple. Uh, before I start with anything, as Moini said, I'm Ranjini Prabhupada working as Vice President and Financial Coach with Happiness Factory. And I'm very, very proud to represent my company, um, you know, Happiness Factory, which truly, truly adds ripples of happiness in the lives of people. Just to give you a quick introduction about Happiness Factory, where we manage assets under management to the tune of 4,500 crores over the last 17, 18 years that we've been into existence since 2005. Uh, and it's, it's a very nice feeling to know that we are an extended family member to over 4,000 happy families, not just in India, but across the globe, across 15 countries that we're catering to uh, client families. Um, and this could never have been possible had we not had a passionate team of 100 plus that we have. We're always ready to go that extra mile to bring a smile on our clients' faces and make, make their life truly happy rich. And uh, we work out of Mumbai, Bangalore, Kolkata, right? I think uh, one thing that I really want to mention about our journey, you know, that we since we started, uh, we've had a lot of learnings. It's been a remarkable journey. And I think one learning that early on we had clearly was the fact that every professional is very, very different, right? I'm sure, you know, every professional in terms of the way they think about money, the challenges that they, you know, have around money, the, the mindset with which they, um, you know, need to discuss about money, all of these things clearly differ. And that clearly gave us a real, you know, lesson that it cannot be a one thing for all. Uh, and it's extremely important to understand what are the typical challenges, what ticks them, what is not right, what are the things that we need to bring about as course corrections for those specific set of professionals. And that's how, over the journey, we've been able to build up very, very robust verticals, truly practices to, you know, reckon with for managing exclusive professional segments. So we have a CXO uh, segment in terms of a CXO vertical, uh, which I'm... Uh, very, very uh, strongly, uh, you know, connected with my uh, senior executives. We have a business owner's practice. We have a doctor's practice. We have women exclusive practice. We have NRIs. We have retirees and a segment of women or single parents. I think this is very, very sensitive because each segment clearly has different seg you know different type of challenges that they would want to be able to address so this expertise has really helped us a long way to be able to build up this wonderful community of client families that we create so retiring the new normal i'm sure this is where we all want to be right doing what we want when we want i think that's the right place to be in to start this second innings but to be able to be here, what I have seen over the last decade or so that I have been working with CXOs, there's a huge you know, spectrum within which there is a retirement mindset that is um, there with different segment of um, senior executives that I've been working with, right? There are certain professionals who are absolutely so very passionate about their work life that they just don't want to retire. Right. And that's a great place to be. And of course, still the time that, you know, health permits you to be doing what you love doing uh, to some people who are already, you know, probably at the age of 46, 47 and clearly are ready to take the plunge into the second innings to be moving out of, you know, this this role of uh, managing a corporate setup to be able to do something else of their choice. And they've done it all absolutely right from understanding, doing a deep dive, whether they're ready to take that plunge. I think that's one very important question that each one of us needs to answer to, to be able to ensure that, you know, a second innings is seamless. And this is that segment that I've seen where they've done it right, maybe early on saying that, look, this is the age that I want to hang up my boots and do something else. And these are the things that I had to take care of and I'm ready to take the plunge. That's a great thing. So these are actually two ends of the spectrum. But in between that, you would have people who would want to have a traditional retirement age of 60, which is very, very normal. 
uh, there are people who are looking at taking sabbaticals. I think this is something that in my journey, probably in the last five, six years or so, I have seen this more often um, than what I probably encountered earlier. And that is more to probably, you know, for some to hone their skill sets. For some, it's about taking that break and trying something new, um, you know, knowing very, very, very well for the fact that if there is something that's not really working as for their, um, you know, expectations, they can always come back to this particular um, role of being a, a CXO again, right? So that could be one of the, there are so many other reasons that each one has in terms of taking that sabbatical, but that's clearly something that's very, very evident today uh, in the way, um, you know, CXOs think. Um, there are yet others who want to retire early, but they do not know if they can. And this, uh, let me tell you, I have really been, um, you know, working with a lot of these kinds of professionals who are very vulnerable lot, you know, who it's it's more about the burnout. It's more about the fact, uh, I would say it's out of no choice rather than a choice wanting to retire. They just want to kind of get out of this and probably, um, you know, break loose from whatever pressures they're undergoing. But they're very, very apprehensive because they truly do not know uh, are they really take, ready to take that plunge? This is this the next segment of people that I'm talking about are those uh, real, um, you know, uh, aggressive uh, kind of uh, professionals who love to be uh, an entrepreneur, right? That is That spark is always there in them. They've never uh, got a chance earlier to do that. But uh, today, I think they're really thinking very seriously about wanting to start their second innings uh, by retiring early and, get, you know, holding the hat of an entrepreneur brilliant uh you know thought process i have i have interacted a lot with a lot of these kind of uh professionals as well so clearly you know if you look at it this entire journey is all about at the end of the day leading the retired life of your choice right and that's 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 the place to be in so while we were talking about the various aspirations, I think one thing that I, I probably wanted to touch upon, and these are the soft uh, aspects that I'm looking at, and there could be so many more things that we need to consider. But I think this has been uh, through a lot of uh, discussions that I've been having with CXO in terms of when they decide that they want to take this plunge and hold the hat of an entrepreneur. What are the key areas that they have always looked at focusing on to be able to make that a success? Focus on your why. It's so very important that any decision that you take needs to have a very specific purpose, right? It could be right from probably, you know, um, creating employment opportunities or maybe creating a culture of your own because of which you want to be an entrepreneur or, you know, something that you've not been happy about with, um, you know, what you're doing today that will give you an opportunity to probably, uh, you know, look at and so on and so forth. But the fact remains that has to be so compelling that it needs to have a clear understanding of, yes, this is where I want to be post my second, you know, post my uh, uh, innings of being a CXO, right? And then, of course, comes the idea of weighing the pros and cons of your position. It cannot be just getting up on the wrong side of the bed and just thinking, okay, tomorrow I would want to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't work like that. Chiseling your skill set for the next big role, absolutely, because there are so many parameters which as an entrepreneur versus a CXO, there is a stark difference in the way you think, in the way you work, um, everything changes. So I think that's a very important aspect, both on the technical aspects and on the soft skill aspect. Brainstorm with your family and put it up to your sounding board. Now, this is extremely important because for any crucial you know, decision that you take, you will agree that, you know, being an entrepreneur from being a CXO, one of the key sea change that you will see in your life is the kind of, you know, financial uh, cash flow position that you are going to be getting into. So it's very, very important to involve your family at this stage before you take the plunge to really make them aware of what to expect from here on uh, that in case you actually take the plunge, uh, how is it going to impact the family as a whole? Because they need to be buying into it. They need to be able to help you. And as a team, you can take this forward. Putting it up to your sounding board, all of us do have mentors, a team of our colleagues, friends, whom we always sound off, you know, ideas that we have. And it's very nice to do this because you get a very unbiased or a third person view about what you thinking, what you're thinking to kind of, uh, you know, whether that is an appropriate decision or there is a different viewpoint that we haven't really thought to. And again, that, of course, doing a survey of the whole idea that you have put in place. The next thing to do clearly would be to prepare a roadmap, right? Because as I always said, 
financial commitments are going to be the key thing that will decide whether you can actually comfortably take the plunge or not. And that would mean personal commitments which matter to you and your loved ones. And there could be, you know, uh, financial commitments which you might need to look at in terms of maybe some sort of a capital infusion in the kind of entrepreneurship venture that you're looking into. So all of this needs to have a clear roadmap in terms of where you are today, what could be the likely sources that you can tap, how do you ensure that all of these things can be managed before you take the plunge. One of the very important questions of should you be really hanging up your boots um, you know, as a CXO before setting up your venture into a cruise mode. There is no right or wrong answer. This is what I realized, you know, during my discussions with CXOs because for everybody to himself or herself, clearly a lot of things matter, right? But for some, it's about, you know, giving in their 110% into the new uh, entrepreneurship venture that one would want to look at for which, you know, if they need the time, the brain uh, uh, time that you might want to look at or your personal space that you're looking at, all of it clearly would probably mean that they might want to, you know, move out of the role of a CXO, which is very, very demanding in today's day and time, and then, you know, focus on this. But before doing that, is it also going to satisfy all the financial requirements for you? Uh, because in case you, you know, kind of give everything up and you end up going into this new venture uh, without really uh, testing the waters, there could be a possibility that it can, you know, backfire. So clearly, these are questions that one really needs to think about before honing the hat of not. What if may be your, um, you know, aspiration for... Uh, leading your retired innings uh, of your choice. I think one thing that I clearly know is there are a lot of very common mistakes that as working professionals we tend to make. And these are mistakes that can really cost us a lot in our journey uh, to make our life absolutely happy. Rich. So I just want to kind of bring down some of those key things that I have time and again come up, uh, you know, in the lives of um, uh, working professionals. Uh, the first one is not saving enough for your retirement. Now, this is because of the fact that our perception about a need versus reality, there is a stark difference. We are not able to come align our thoughts in terms of what is the right number that I should have, which will help us to be able to save enough and work towards making that corpus ready for ourselves. That's a dangerous situation to be in. And I've seen a lot of, you know, working professionals, very unfortunate. They barely have about a year or two uh, before retirement and they realize that they do, do not have enough. And that's not a time to really think about, oh, how do I, you know, un, um, kind of, you know, reverse the wheel and try and... Um, bridge the gap in in the period that i have i'm left with uh so clearly this is one area that all of us need to think about that really working understanding what is the number and working towards building up the scores saving without a plan i think saving is something that as indians typically you know at a very young age we have instilled those values of saving but clearly Saving without a purpose again is 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 a big failure. I mean, it's it's about saying that we are working so hard today to be able to ensure that you know we can enjoy the lifestyle that we all want to lead, right? But post retirement, what we want is that our money needs to work a lot more to be able to help us continue to lead the same lifestyle. Now, if that is the situation, then clearly we need to be able to ensure that our money is you know invested in a very optimal structured fashion. Starting to save too late, I'm sure this is something, uh, you know, which is quite evident uh, in today's generation uh, of that newly found freedom uh, with uh, probably the very young, you know, CXOs that I have interacted with. Uh, it's all about, you know, uh, living life for today, you know, uh, uh, work really hard, party harder. It's the you know, the things that are going to happen tomorrow, why, why do you think about it today? There's still a long way for retirement. Why do you want to even start thinking about it today? Let's like enjoy uh, it to the brain. But this is something, you know, we don't realize that time just flies. And again, it's too late before you decide that, oh, I should have started saving. And this, this habit of saving, you know, starting at an early age can stay very well with you uh, all through your work life. But if that doesn't happen, that can uh, clearly be a absolute dampener. So one uh, hygiene parameter that we always recommend to our clients is that you should have at least 30% of your total take-home income as your savings before you, you know, enjoy uh, to your fullest with the remaining component of the money that you're making. Living burdened with debt. 
uh, I I used to always think, you know, that uh, the West is the place where um, it's always a credit uh, society or the fact that people are so driven by the credit culture. Uh, I thought India was more a, a matured lot where we, or maybe the earlier generation was like that, uh, where borrowing was just absolutely out of absolute necessity. It was never uh, kind of, you know, at all points in time that, you know, we just go about anything that we want. It's more about uh, having a great lifestyle, you know, borrow. Do whatever you want to do, have the best gadget that you want to acquire, go and borrow. Because it's become so easy today for us to acquire everything in the name of the EMI culture. But the, the one thing that we somehow tend to forget is, you know, these EMIs are something that we will have to only be able to kind of fulfill or we will only have to service it for the rest of the period of the uh, borrowing. So it's very, very important for us to realize that we should never, ever go overboard as far as our borrowing capacity is concerned. Clearly, borrowing is a great leverage to have and you should, you know, address it with the right level of control on it. So we believe that you should never, ever exceed 40% of your total take home in terms of any sort of borrowing that you might have. This will keep you in good stead, even in you know situations where there could have been a loss of job or maybe a pay cut, etc. Not understanding the fine print. I think every one of us at some point in time in our lives clearly have been victims to this. I have been too, right? And I'm sure all of us would agree to this uh, on, on this one for sure because typically all our documents you know run into pages we just don't have time time is such a huge constraint and again the legal you know jargons that are associated with it we don't have the uh, you know mind with uh, to kind of really think and understand all of this but that doesn't give us the luxury of signing on the dotted line without knowing what we're getting into so it's very very important to vet these documents with the right professional before we actually sign them right Listening to casual investment advice. Isn't this something that, you know, all of us enjoy um, during our chai kattas or our lunch table conversations? All of us want to kind of take a break from our uh, business discussions, you know, all of that stuff. But and that's a time when we have um, our colleagues, we have uh, probably uh, options to uh, watch CNBC and all of those um, spaces which can give us some uh, quick you know, fixes or quick uh, tips that we can uh, use to be able to invest our money, right? Uh, I would I would just want to, you know, bring in one thing very clear here, right? It's not about that any particular product is completely banned or that any product is something that's absolutely, um, you know, not having any sort of risk parameters. Everything has its own risk and goods. It's about understanding what is relevant in your life situation. What is relevant to you might not be relevant to me and vice versa. So it's very, very important to understand that your investment decisions cannot be as casual as just going with, you know, some tips or something that has been um, provided to you um, at a lunch table conversation. There has to be a lot more analysis that needs to be done in your life situation and then a decision taken. Spending from the retirement fund, yet another thing that is so, so very uh, common, um, you know, with Indians. As Indian families, I think we are always having that feeling that, you know, as parents, we should always be there for our children. I think somewhere, you know, the detachment to be able to make our children independent somewhere is lost because we always think we have to cocoon them from any sort of an insecurity that we can keep protecting them. And in the whole bargain, we are completely giving up our set, second innings, you know, in, in, in I mean, completely away where we do not know whether we can survive on our own post our um, you know work life right and that's clearly not something that we should be doing retiring with absolute sense of pride and a sense of security is extremely important into this day and time so what's the right way to go about doing this this is what we call the planned product process approach right what does that mean it's about laying a foundation First, about understanding what is your purpose with your money? Why are you investing your money? It's so important for you to seek answers to this, right? And that will set the stage right and, you know, get the ball rolling from a perspective of what are the things that you need to do? What are the things that you should be careful about, right? And the next clear, you know, con uh, next question that is obviously um, an aligned one is about how much is really enough? Do we really know what is the right number we are chasing? All the time when we're thinking about investing, it's about kitna deti hai, kaha se kitna kaise ban, paise baninge, double kaise kare, triple kaise kare, right? 
But it's not as simple as that. If that was so simple, all of us would have been minting money. But that's not the case, right? Because we do not know what we are doing and why we are doing what we do. So we need to identify that, understand the right number. It's about what is the quantum of money that we should be ready with. That will clearly give us a perspective of what level of risk we should be taking, what is the minimum pace of growth that it should have. And that will give us an understanding of how we should be, you know, uh, ensuring that our investment strategies are aligned to that. The second thing, of course, as part of the um, the right way of doing it is what we call the financial fitness check. So all along, you know, till date, probably we've been taking a lot of financial decisions or maybe we've just been uh, procrastinating. But, you know, there is money, there is saving, all of that is there. But now is the time to do a deep dive and understand whether whatever decisions or, you know, no decisions being taken till here, are they aligned to our objective with our money? Because now we have a very limited work life or shelf life that we have left to make money. And this is a time to clearly do a deep dive and understand are we in the best of financial health, or not, right? Once we do this, then clearly all the, you know, asset allocation that we will have as part of our, you know, investment strategies will be absolutely aligned to help us achieve the key objectives that you've set for the understanding of the why, as I said, could be any of these or all of these in every professional's life, right? We need to understand what it is, understand how much is enough, and then start working towards it. Now, I'm going to be taking one very beautiful case study, okay? Because when we understand the why, we also, as I said, lot many times, it's all about the gap between our perception about our requirement and the reality, right? And I'm going to take this to one simple example uh, of retirement since I think retirement is the key focus area that I'm wanting to look at. So here's a gentleman at the age of 55 wanting to retire at 60. Yeah, the uh, life expectancy, today's day 90. The need that he stated is that he needs about a lakh of rupees per month, okay, uh, to come to him post his age of 60 and it should last him at least till his age of 90. Now, he believes that a return of 9% on the corpus that he already has, about one and a half CR, is absolutely good enough to give him a completely seamless second release. Is he right? Unfortunately, he's far from the reality. Right? What has gone wrong here? The biggest thing that he's not taken into the math is what we call inflation. This is one of the biggest monsters that can play a complete spoil sport and can clearly derail us from what we want to achieve in our lives, right? So what he actually needs is about 3.37 crores if he wants to lead the lifestyle that he's always wanted to do, right? So imagine almost double of what he anticipated. Now, if this realization comes in at the fag end of our career, think about how impactful will that be or how could it really derail all our aspirations for a second in So it's very, very important to understand the fact that we need to start early on. And that's where I'm going to introduce the second concept of what we call the cost of creating. Right now, here the same gentleman we're talking about at the age of 55. I'm quickly running you past somebody who's at the age of 45. So there is a gap of 10 years between the two of them. The need is exactly the same one lakh per month. Retirement age is 60. Inflation is at 6%. Now, just think about it. The person who's at the age of 45, okay, the lack of rupees that he's thinking as of today that he needs with inflation the need is actually translating to about 2.27 lakhs per month for the 45 year old against uh, the guy who is at 55 the need of a lakh would be basically about 1.34 at his age of 60 now to ensure that this is mind you this 2.27 lakhs per month or 1.34 is at the age of 60 but it will keep getting inflated year on year right it's not going to stop because you have stopped uh, working Right. So the corpus that is required to ensure that he can have this lifestyle sustainable for the rest of his, um, you know, 30 years of lifestyle that you're looking at for that. The gentleman at 45 needs about five and a half year as against the guy at 55 who needs about 3.37. But what is the cost of doing it? Because this gentleman has started 10 years later, the quantum of saving that he needs to have is about 4.36 lakh per month as against somebody who had that 10, 10 years prior needs only about 1.25 lakhs. Think about, you know, whether that is practically feasible or not. So it's very, very important to realize that, you know, 
any decision that you need to take, it cannot be something that is going to happen overnight. We need to really think, work backwards and start early on so that we can take the magic of compounding to help us in our race. At the same time, we will ensure that the cost of delay is not going to delay us, right? So while we've understood all of this, let me just put all of this into a perspective, into a very simple uh, case study. This is our own client family. Of course, the names have been changed for confidentiality purposes. But I'm going to tell you how we have helped this particular family to ensure that they can lead the second innings of their you know, uh, aspiration or, or of their choice if they're able to you know, address all that they want to do during your work. Right? So here is Mr. Kamath, age of 40. Is a corporate executive wanting to retire at 50. His wife Deepa is also a working professional. They have a daughter called Anushka, uh, age at six years. The total joint income is five lakhs per month. Okay. Uh, they have different types of you know investments. You have PF, FD, MFs, there are ESOPs or stocks, ULIPs, PPF, all of this is available with Mr. Kamath. He wishes to set aside 50 lakh for an entrepreneurship venture that he intends to start. So he always mentioned to us that, you know what, Ranjini, when I retire, I really want to try my hand at something new. And so he said that, you know, this is, uh, I have already thought I have an idea and this is the quantum of money that I would want to set aside for it. Uh, so he has an EMI of about a lakh and 50,000 per month. That's going to continue for another 10 years. So if you've noticed, for this one gentleman, one good thing is the fact that in the next 10 years, his EMI or all his liabilities are going to be knocked off, right? And that's a great time, great place because, you know, at the time of retirement, you should ensure that whenever you hang up your boots, you don't have a single pie of liability on your head, right? That's the first hygiene parameter that one needs to observe. Uh, the household expenses are about a lakh and 50,000 per month. So I'm going to quickly create this plan and show you how we're going to be helping them. Just give me a minute. Uh, I hope everybody is able to see the screen, right? So here is this gentleman, Mr. Kamath, who's at the age of 40. Let's see what are the key commitments that he wants to address. One is clearly an emergency key. He believes that there is always a necessity to set aside about uh, a lakh and 50,000 of you know, per month for an entire year for any sort of a medical situation or any emergency in the form of, you know, any sort of a sudden um, you know, professional uh, uh, mishap or whatever it could be, he would say that he would want to set aside the slack and 50,000 separately for that emergency. So that's how the, um, you know, that you, that's how you see, just one second, I'm sorry about this. Yeah. So that is the first thing that he said he would want to address. The next one is their parents' health. So this is something I'm, I really appreciate his thought process. He being a single son, he was very clear that he would want to take care of his parents. His parents do have a health insurance of about 15 lakhs, but he said that I clearly want to set aside something beyond that. They are at the age of around 67, 68. And he said that, you know, with medical conditions, uh, he would want to ensure that he has enough and more for a situation like this, especially because he wants to be wanting to retire uh, early on, um, you know, than the normal traditional retirement age. So retirement is at the age of 50 for him. Let's see what does this mean. Now, this is a very important aspect. He wants to retire at the age of 50 and his need was a lakh and 50,000 per month as on today at his age of 40. So this quantum of money that he's talking is uh, a good component to be, you know, helping him lead the lifestyle of his choice. It actually becomes about two and a half lakhs when he is, uh, you know, reaching the age of 50. And beyond that also to continue to keep getting income. To be able to ensure that he is able to sustain this lifestyle for the rest of his life, at least for the next 35 to 40 years of his, you know, lifespan, lifespan that he's blessed with, he should be able to build up a corpus of approximately seven and a half senior. If he has this corpus, he should be able to lead his second only seamlessly. Now, what is shown here is basically the fact that in case this gentleman has not done anything till now, he needs to start with a saving of about 3.6 lakhs per month for the next 10 years. But we have seen with Mr. Kamath that he has been a good saver. He's had 
uh, some sort of investments. Let's see what are those investments and how is it going to ensure that it will take care of the sickness, right? The next thing that we saw is he needs to start an entrepreneurship uh, venture for which uh, he needed 50 lakhs then at, at the time when he's wishing to retire. And the third part is the retired health corpus. He's always been very, very sensitive to this, the fact that, you know, health insurance alone might not be sufficient for him and he needs to clearly set aside something beyond that. And that's the reason why he said that about 20 lakhs for him and his spouse is something that he would like to set aside for any sort of a medical, um, you know, emergency post his retirement. Now, while he's taking care of all of this, clearly one big thing that he needs to look at is about his daughter's academic, um, you know, pursuits and her marriage. So here is what he did. Um, though she's just six, um, she seems to be inclined towards doing, you know, a lot of things with uh, the kind of toys that she has, uh, the Legos and stuff like that. So he believes that she's going to probably pursue her engineering. And that's when he said that I would need to set aside about 25 lakhs of today, which should be good enough to address his, you know, address her engineering program when she actually uh, gets into the 12th grade. So that's about 63 lakhs for her, for her undergrad program. Then comes a PG and he has an aspiration to send her abroad for a PG. So he set aside 75 lakhs of today to be able to make that happen. Okay. Over and above that, the one thing that he said that being a single child, he said at least a basic marriage is something that he should be prepared for. So he set aside about 15 lakhs for the marriage for his daughter. So this kind of takes care of all the key commitments that he needs to be able to address if he wants to hang up his boots at the age of 12. Now that we've known that these are the key uh, requirements, let's try and understand what is it that he is already having to be able to make it happen. So he's got 30 lakhs in FD, mutual funds about 50 lakhs, um, policy is about 10 lakhs, PPF 10 lakhs, PF is about 50 lakhs and stocks he's got about 50 lakhs. Okay, so by allocating this and making relevance of these, you know, investments in his life, what we said was FD of 15 lakhs to be set aside clearly for any sort of an emergency not to be touched. Parents health, we will move the money from the FD into more appropriate channels so that it can grow meaningfully and be able to address the need that he wants to take care of, right? Uh, retirement, he has already got his PPF and PF that we are going to set aside for him for his retirement. Yeah. Then we have mutual funds, so 20 lakhs assigned to uh, his entrepreneurship uh, need. For Anushka's program, very important. We have to set aside um, enough to take care of that. Yeah, uh, for the PG component, mutual funds, and you look whatever was left, and then for Anushka's marriage, whatever two lakhs of FT that was left, that is also being attached to it. The idea of telling you uh, in terms of this allocation is to give you a perspective that it's very, very important to understand that how do you ensure that each of this is earmarked for a definitive event in one's life so that that is appropriately utilized, right? Also, his cash flow position clearly gave us a lot of understanding of where he is. And we realized that he has, after all the expenses, uh, he has a saving of about 1.74 lakhs. So we said that we need to at least channelize about one and a half lakhs at this point in time towards taking care of his needs. Okay. So here we have. Yes. So if you look at all of this, what you'll realize is that with a monthly saving of a lakh and 50,000 per month and with his existing assets that he has, he should be moving closer to his, uh, you know, required needs. The only big gap is the retirement corpus. Now, clearly, 
at the time of retirement, there will be settlement benefits. In the, in the next 10 years of his work life, he's going to get bonuses. There will be ESOPs that could be, you know, vested. There'll be so many other things that can come into play. And those windfalls will try, we will try and bridge the gap. But the idea behind it is that if he's able to channelize his savings optimally, he's able to ensure that all his, you know, existing investments are appropriately mapped to his needs, he should be able to take care of a second innings seamless, right? So coming back to the next part, now that we have understood how we help this particular um, family, uh, are you able to uh, see the screen, please? Can somebody just confirm once? Not yet. Is this screen visible to everybody, please? Right now, the screen is not shared. No, okay. Thanks so much. Okay, I hope this is visible to everybody, right? So the key focus areas for happy retirement, whatever you wish to do, clearly retirement plan to be chalked out. Health corpus for self and dependence, we saw that is very, very critical. A contingency kitty that needs to be set aside ensuring that all crucial family commitments are provided for, managing cash flow well while working. Very, very important aspects. I'm just putting the key pointers just to kind of reiterate what are the key areas that we need to be ready for if we want to clearly, clearly uh, start our second living series, right? Risk mitigation tools to be in place, be it health or life, right? Health insurance is extremely important. Please don't take it as an expenditure which is unwanted. It is something that will just come to you, you know, without knocking your door and you need to be prepared for it. So clearly a health uh, insurance and a term insurance for those who are either the key contributors in the family, who have dependents or liabilities should necessarily take a term insurance. Prudently reviewing investments and consolidation of portfolio. This is so, so very critical because life is so dynamic. You might, you know, be forced with so many challenges, so many sudden surprises. If we are not able to align our plan, always, you know, in sync with our real life situation, uh, sitting with a stale plan clearly is going to derail all our, um, you know, aspirations in life. Ensuring that all your documentation is in order and the family is aware of it. We've had umpteen cases, very, very unfortunate, that, you know, the key bread owner for the family is an absolute, complete know-how of the whole situation, is in control of everything. But unfortunately, that control is not really passed on or shared with the family, the spouse or the key stake, um, you know, uh, holders in the family. It's so very, very important in case of the eventuality of the death of the you know, bread owner for the family. Imagine what they would go through. And I have been handling a lot of, you know, uh, single mothers taking care of their children. And, um, you know, it, it's been a very, very painful journey. Uh, for me, it has been really humbling. But please, this is something that each one of us really needs to do to at least make our people aware that this is what we are invested in. These are the documents that are set aside. These are the key people that you can reach out to in case of any sort of an urgency. That's about enough, even if the spouse or somebody is not interested. But getting them involved to the basic need is something that's very important. Getting your will ready. Very, very, very important, right? I mean, you have been painstakingly creating your assets all your life, working so hard. Would you not want to ensure that these assets are seamlessly passed on to the legal heirs, you know, in the right way without any sort of, you know, conflicts within the family? To be able to do that, please, please write a will. There is always a, you know, a myth. There is always this mind block with all of us when we think that, you know, if we write a will tomorrow, we are no more. That's clearly, I think that really needs a major, uh, you know, shift in, term, in terms of the thought process that, that we have. So finally, quickly, all the building blocks in order, if everything set aside in a pyramid with a beautiful foundation laid, I think you, you are there uh, and you will be able to address all that you uh, wanted to take care of in your life. Now that we have, you know, understood the journey of our work life, 
right? To be able to do the right things, understand the pitfalls and ensure that that is going to work for us. I think one question still is always lingering in everybody's mind saying that, okay, I think I'm going to be doing it right all my life. But how do I know that whatever I have built is genuinely, genuinely good enough for me for my second year, right? So it's extremely important to have that sense of assurance, a sense of uh, comfort level that yes, I really have enough. What is it that my money is going to take care of me post my second year, right? We call this the five L's of retirement, okay? First one being no liability whatsoever. As I said, there shouldn't be a single pie of, you know, um, any sort of debt on your head when you decide to hack it. Sufficient liquidity. You never know, you know, what kind of sudden requirement can come up, especially once you have retired. So liquidity is extremely important in the second phase of your life. The third is lifestyle sustenance. I'm sure all of us are working, you know, crazy today, day in, day out, toiling so hard. I think the whole objective is about wanting to lead that second inning with the same sense of pride, with the same sense of comfort that we have led um, through our work life. We don't want to kind of reduce that, right? So clearly, we need to have enough to be able to help us maintain our lifestyle. Fourth is longevity protection. If we are blessed with, you know, genes, uh, to be able to lead a wonderful long innings, that should never be a bane. It should be something that you should be looking forward to, to you know, make the most of it, right? And finally, after doing all of this, if you have enough and more to leave behind as legacy, either for your children or giving it back to the society, I have known of so many such, um, you know, aspirations that uh, my clients have conveyed to me. So it could be any of the things that you would want to do. If the money that you have really built up is going to be addressing these three objectives. Don't you think that's the only thing that you need in your second innings? If this is taken care of, I'm sure all of us are absolutely, you know, going to be so vibrantly ready to be, you know, facing our second innings with a sense of pride and happiness, right? So let me just kind of take you through how we've been helping you know, uh, people who are at the threshold wanting to take the plunge, uh, giving them that sense of uh, assurance that yes, you are future ready, okay? So the same example that we just saw, fast forward to 10 years, uh, Mr. Kamal, we created a plan for him to ensure that we are able to address these key objectives. Let me quickly run you past that. You'll have to give me again, give me another minute again to run to my other um, plan to share with you. Okay, so we know the case, right? Um, they needed about a lakh and 50,000 per month. Let me just kind of quickly brief you on what was the case. So Mr. Kamath, uh, both of them working, they had a daughter, Anushka, they have a daughter called Anushka, and uh, they need about a lakh and 50,000 per month uh, as a retirement needs uh, or, or an income that will address their lifestyle sustainability, right? One and a half lakhs at their age of 40 meant about two and a half lakhs uh, today at uh, Mr. Kamath's age of 50, fast forward 10 years. Two and a half lakhs per month would mean 30 lakhs annually, right? What are we set for to address with this particular corpus? We are assuming that the seven and a half cross that we said should be ready is now ready for Mr. Kamath to take the part. So the key objectives would be to ensure that there is enough to help him, you know, give get the payout on a monthly basis, year on year for the rest of his life to sustain a lifestyle that he's always wanted to do, right? So that means the payouts need to be steady, need to be consistent month on month, year on year. Second thing is to ensure that there is safety to the payouts. What I mean by that is that this is not going to be impacted by any sort of vagaries of market risk, which can give you sleepless nights. It cannot be that the person is thinking, oh, tomorrow am I going to get my uh, monthly payout or no? what happens to the next month of my retirement? That should not be the case. So clearly ensuring that that is sustainable. Safety is absolutely key factor that is being uh, taken into account. Third is to ensure that longevity is protected, that if I lead my life till the age of 90, do I really have this um, purpose that is going to last me a lifetime, giving me the payouts that I wish to. Fourth is, in case there is any sort of a medical emergency, do I have the flexibility to add to my medical contingency at any point? Right? Fifth is to ensure that with all of this, there is liquidity at 
any and every point in time in every phase of your second years. And finally, leaving, leaving behind the legacy that you've always wanted to for your daughter. If this is something that you aspire to do, if these can be taken care of, I am sure the key object is on But one very important thing that is always also there in, in the minds of a retiree is how can I be as tax efficient as I can, right? Because clearly, you don't have any other source of earning. This is all that you have and you want to make it as tax efficient as you can get, right? So here is, um, you know, our proposed portfolio that we created for this gentleman. So 30 lakhs annually, which is two and a half lakhs per month. We created a ladder of income for seven years for this particular family to ensure that that should give them two and a half lakhs per month, month on month, year on year. It will slowly start getting inflated, you know, over a period of time. Okay, so that was the first thing that we needed to think about. And we also decided that why he did create a, a contingency kitty for his post-retirement health corpus. He said that, you know, I wouldn't mind if we just top it up and, you know, a little more to it. So we said we will set aside an additional 10 lakhs towards that particular medical corpus of 20 lakhs, which is probably already going to have gone to about 60 lakhs there and another 10 lakhs that will also continue. Okay, so those are the two things that we did. By creating this basket that we are looking at for the next seven years, we said that this money is going to be into absolutely, you know, risk-free kind of an asset, uh, you know, allocation, which is purely into debt, which will ensure that at no point in time, any of the market vagaries will ever impact, right? So the seven-year payout that can be kept in an FD, it can be kept in liquid, it can be kept in arbitrage, whatever it might be. The idea also is that we should not lose sight about the fact that we want to also be as tax efficient as we can get. Okay, so here, what we would recommend in this situation is to be probably setting it aside into pure debt, which is going to help you be tax efficient, right? So we've created a ladder of income for the next seven years, but we also wanted to be sure that this corpus is all that he has, and we need to ensure that it, you know, outlasts him. So whatever was the quantum of money that was left after creating this ladder of income for seven years for this family, we actually parked it into diversified equity funds, into very, very, um, you know, minimalistic risk, which is into pure blue chips. So, you know, no risks about any fundamental issue and so on and so forth for them. Again, understanding what is the, see, this is something that we created for this particular family. This is so very, very important to realize that it will be customized to each family requirements based on the risk appetite, based on the quantum of corpus they have, based on the kind of lifestyle need that they wish to have, based on the fact that if there is a medical emergency that they are more worried about and they're not really provided for, how do we set aside enough for that particular requirement and then create this ladder of income which will, uh, you know, address the objectives that we have set for them. So for this family, we set aside the remaining component into diversified equity funds, which would clearly, you know, achieve our objective to be able to beat inflation and be able to ensure that the corpus is going to be uh, able to grow at a pace which will be able to replenish all that we are utilizing for the lifestyle needs and also help you lead your lifestyle till you're alive probably for 90 or even with God's grace beyond that, right? So by doing this and maintaining the pace of growth at a very simple growth of about 9.7%, we realized that we could clearly give this family a life of their choice with not just the money outlasting them, but also having enough to leave behind as a legacy for the daughter, right? So this is something that we created for this family, which protected key things of lifestyle sustenance, longevity protection, legacy uh, being passed on, uh, you know, maintenance of safety of the payouts that uh, needed to be paid out on, on a month-on-month -month basis. The liquidity was also uh, absolutely kept in place. One important thing now we will show you how we also ensured that the tax efficiency part of it is something that we also um, gave them a lot of comfort on that front, right? So in the proposed plan that we created, the biggest advantage is that it is going to be, the tax is going to be applicable only on withdrawal, okay? So let's look at how we've tried to reduce the tax implication. So if you look at it, the payout ladders that we created were into 
asset classes, which is not going to grow massively. The objective with those uh, baskets was not to be able to grow the money, but to be able to ensure that it's absolutely as safe as it can get. Uh, simplified in terms of payout that can be uh, made to the client on a monthly basis. And the tax on the tax outgo is minimalistic. So if with that objective, clearly you would see that if this is the kind of gain that they made, there was clearly no effective tax that this family had to pay for the first four years because of the way it has been strategized, right? Similarly, in the last few years is when there would be some tax, obviously because of the tax bracket that we are looking at. But the bottom line of the whole story is that we've been trying to make it as tax efficient as possible. So this gave Mr. Kamath that absolute comfort level that he has sorted to, and he can actually take the plunge if he clearly works through the next 10 years of his work life. And if this corpus is built up, he will be able to address all that he's wanted to do in the second innings, right? So I think with that, I actually come to the end of my uh, session. Um, I'll be more than happy to kind of, um, you know, take questions from you. Um, and I hope this was valuable to you. It's, it's something that was very close to my heart. So I try to make it, uh, you know, as as um, simplified and certain valuable inputs that I really would want all of you to take away from. So thank you so much for being such a patient listener. And uh, I'll just share my coordinates here with you. And you can let me know if... Just yes, thank you so much, seconds. Anjani. And uh, thank you for sharing your expertise. And the key, case studies which you have presented has been very invaluable guidance for all of us. So I, I personally believe that this session is not going to be just... Uh, for the education but also it has inspired us to take a proactive step towards securing our uh, investments yeah you can uh, take it in a moini you can actually uh... yeah when you can take it forward from your own yes yes so Thank am i audible so Is my voice audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, okay, thank you. So uh, I believe that uh, we have one question in the chat, which is uh, for you, Ranjani. Uh, Ranjani, you are able to uh, hear me, right? Okay, so I'll just check. Hello? Yeah, Ranjani, uh, am I audible to you? Moini, am I audible? You are audible, but uh, are you able to hear me? I'm not able to hear you. Okay. So, uh, Iqbal, if you can just uh, personally get in touch with Anjani to check the this connection issue. And meanwhile, I will request all the participants that my team has uh, put the feedback link in the chat. So it will be great if you all can uh, fill up that form and uh, let us know how was your overall experience. And uh, moreover, in some time, in you know, after this QA, in two, three, next two, three minutes, I will be beginning up with the Wheel of Fortune, uh, whoever filled up the feedback form. And one lucky winner will get a chance to win CXO Junction goodies. So the link is in the chat. So meanwhile, uh, from the back end, my team is checking uh, with Ranjani. Yes, so link is there. Uh, I believe some people are uh, taking it up. So yes, so I believe Ranjani will be reading out the questions and uh, requesting you to uh, give all the answers. Yep. Yeah, okay. So let me just, on what basis are the estimates for monthly investment needed? need to mention estimated IRR from investments and what time of risk you need to take in investments accordingly to plan for monthly investment needed as per risk appetite. Can somebody just kind of, uh, you know, uh, put in this question a little more? Can I talk about it, Moeen? Yeah, yeah, please do. Please do. Okay. So what I was just trying to say now, there were estimates given. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, when you say monthly, you want to put 
so much money to achieve this target, at what rate of return was it? Because accordingly, you will have to, you know, estimate the risk yes. you will take. Yes. Right? So, we are looking at about, uh, so I was just asking for that because I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No, no, so we were we are looking at about 10 to 11 percent uh, on an average. So, of course, clearly there could be it could be much higher, but we are expecting or we want to at least hit that bare minimum of 10 to 11 percent for uh, investment horizon, which is about six, seven years or whatever. So each of these um, uh, growth estimation is based on the time horizon for your investment and based on the risk appetite uh, of the investor. Right. Noted. So even for six to seven years, you're saying 10 to 11 percent. So you're looking at a That's real the minimum that we are looking at. Right. So we, we will based, as I said, the portfolio structuring is done on each one's individual uh, risk taking capacity, understanding what is the money required for and accordingly ensuring that about 10, 11 uh, or max 12 percent is something that we should bare minimum start looking for uh, in terms of a growth that we want to seen that particular story. got it got it thank you yeah. and one more quick question uh health insurance you said everyone should have so any reason you were also saying keep a health insurance sorry for... yogesh i'm not able to hear you uh is it better now yeah sure thanks okay uh i understand you mentioned you should have a health insurance and on top of it there was a mention of a health insurance corpus yes so Say there should be a separate corpus besides having an independent health insurance plans, which is important yes. for us? Yes, I'll tell you where I'm coming from. So there are a couple of reasons why we say this is extremely important. First and foremost, health insurance typically will, you know, uh, give you a cover to the extent that you're insured, right? But today's medical um, costs are skyrocketing. The cost of the treatment would be much higher, correct? So effectively, this is one to be able to bridge the gap in terms of the need versus what you have as an insurance cover. Now, that doesn't mean that you just go overboard and go and take a health insurance, which is so very high, and you have to continue to keep paying the premium for it, right? But the fact remains that if you are blessed with great health, you're continuing to pay the premium and you are not going to be utilizing that. So that have, there has to be a right balance that in case that particular corpus is not required for a medical situation, especially post your retirement, then that kind of adds to your legacy or you can pass it on to the, um, you know, the next generation. But if it is required, then you are not dipping into your retirement corpus for a medical contingency because what you have planned for is something that should last your lifetime. If there is a huge withdrawal in the form of a medical contingency, it is possible that, you know, what you plan for will kind of get done or get depleted by the age of 75 and what next after that? If you're still, if you continue to be blessed with a you know, lifespan of 90 for the next 10, 15 years of your work life, I mean, of your uh, retired life, how are you going to manage your life, right? So clearly health corpus is on that front. And with today's day and time, I think one of the key things that is a trigger or something that we need to be very careful about is the fact that a lot of cases of dementia, Alzheimer's, etc. are in the offing, right? And I, I, I know very very close family members uh, you know who've been impacted so uh, in a situation like that these are uh, periods where you know it's a clear outflow from your account you don't even realize it people can completely get drained uh, you know i have been a victim in the sense my dad uh, was um, a patient of uh, you know dementia i would spend about a lack of rupees per month on on his assisted living setup so clearly you know you don't know what kind of a medical requirement you might have. So having a med medical corpus or a health corpus over and above an insurance is extremely important. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the next question is from Rajiv Gerila, who says, if we already have a set uh, self set up diversified portfolio, then what additional help would be would be available from your end? So, um, so, Rajiv, what we're going to do is basically, as I said, do a financial fitness checkup, right? You might have something that you already have, and that is obviously not surprising at all. Everybody clearly does something or the other during their work life. It's about understanding how relevant those investments are in line with the objectives that you have set forth to meet with your mom, which means that you we need to co-create a life plan with you understand those 
key critical life events that you want to be prepared for financially. Then understand, you know, what is it that you've done in the past and is it making relevance in your scheme of things? If that is the case, brilliant, you know, continue to do it. It's about then monitoring, reviewing and ensuring that all points in time, whatever plan you have is again, always aligned to your life situation. So there has to be somebody who should be continuously monitoring that. And if there is any course correction that is required, then we will help you in getting that course correction done there and then again continue to mm, help you manage and maintain that particular course. I hope that answers your question. Yes, so the next question is how uh, we calculate our monthly expense growing inflation as 7% or something else? Yeah, so we have been taking inflation at 6%, which is what I have shown. That's typically the historical uh, data point that we have taken to uh, work on the inflational aspects. So and normally we say that, you know, uh, educational inflation is much higher than your lifestyle. So in educational inflation is around 8%. Your lifestyle inflation is around 6%. Okay. And the last question is, shall we consider top-up plan on the health insurance? Yes, you can. I mean, we need to understand how much of health insurance you have and then decide on what is the kind of top up that you will need to do. Ensure that it's a plain vanilla health insurance. Please don't go for any sort of frills. Don't go for any, uh, you know, investment oriented insurance plan because that's clearly a disaster. Um, so it's very, very important to understand what each of these products uh, stand for, right? Because when you talk about insurance cover, it is to mitigate your risk. It is not an investment strategy. So please understand, detach, you know, your investment with your insurance and take the right kind of a policy. Okay. So, uh, with this, uh, thank you so much, Ranjini and uh, the last part of the uh, session is that we are going to run a wheel of fortune on the basis of people who has filled up the feedback form so i request my team to share the screen and let's roll the wheel of fortune meanwhile guys uh, i would actually uh, request everyone that we are going to post a, a post about the session on our linkedin and i request that you give your feedback there as well and let the people know how valuable the session was and how we can improve for the uh, you know better for the next time so the screen is shared. So let's roll the wheel of fortune and see who is the lucky winner for today. And the winner is Prakash Kumar Ranjan. Congratulations, Prakash Kumar. Thank uh, you. Great. So, uh, thank you, sir. And thank you, uh, Ranjini. So, with this, I would like to uh, end this session. Thank you, all the participants, for joining and taking out your time today. And looking forward to interacting again in the future sessions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Atta. Take care. Bye-bye and have a great, great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.